<laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess you could say that, uh, that people worried about what the Fed's going to do, as you've just been uh, discussing and showing, thinking about those equity valuations, and also thinking about possible end of quarter revaluations or rebalancing uh, from the large pension funds and the such, like maybe creating a bit of a flow out of stocks and into bonds. And so that's really put a bit of a, a muffle on the markets uh, towards the end of the year. Um, you know, uh, I, I think that the, there was a general feeling the, the the rebound in stocks that we were seeing was still another one of these bear market rallies rather than the beginning of the end of the very nasty cycle. And so if that starts to bear out a little bit more, uh, we might see more pressure coming in again uh, into, new, into year end and then into the start of next year as well. Paul, it looks like, I mean, it's looking quiet as everyone was pointing out. And I mean, hopefully it is. What a year it's been really for, for, for everyone. But it looks like the BOJ might give us... Mm something to talk about. Certainly, <laughs> there is something today as far as markets go. What's the conversation in your team about uh, about the end and, and, and where perhaps this goes this week? Yeah, yeah. I think I think really massive theme for next year, maybe not a very big theme for tomorrow, is, is really the consensus yeah. view <laughs> at least. But look, I mean, you know, uh, inflation is already way above the BOJ's target. They're just starting to talk about maybe we need to, you know, kind of like go a little bit easier at some point or have a policy review or something really cautious, tentative steps before steps, if you like. We're starting to talk about talking about it in the in the central bank parlance, maybe about the, the move away from the yield curve control, the move away from the uh, very low interest rates and stuff like that. And the market, of course, will start to price that in already. So we're seeing the 10 year yield budding up against the BOJ seeding. We're seeing the two year yields close to turning positive. We're seeing the yen getting that little bit of support and strength again. And I'm sure that there will be plenty of questions for the BOJ about when is the right time to, to move away from such uh, settings. I think what the BOJ wants to see, and it's been very clear about this, is a pickup in wages. Um, we won't see that coming through properly until um, the start of the next quarter when we start to get the negotiations over salaries and stuff like that. So that's really the, the thing I think that everybody's going to be latching onto at the start of next year. But for this policy meeting, yeah. I think we can expect, and you know, we, we could be wrong, but we can expect you know, pretty much par for the course and a lot of uh, stonewalling of all of those questions. Is that the third pivot of next year? <laughs> BOJ pivot? I don't know, That's Paul. Gonna um, I was going to ask you about China. Uh, this rally seems to be, you know, we're, we're, we're fading a little bit in the last few few days or sessions or so. Um, what comes next here? What do we need? I mean, it, you know, you basically are dealing with a spike up in COVID cases, which I think is worrying the market. And then you have a work yeah. conference, which is talking about really, you know, supporting the private sector. What, what should we be focusing on the most? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's another one of these this year, no, now versus next year kind of trades, right, isn't it? If you look at the, the situation on the ground right now, you know, the COVID is just spreading so miraculously quickly. Um, you know, kind of like terrible numbers. I'm sure if you could get a true gauge of it, um, but just anecdotally, you know, kind of it's very widespread. Hopefully, mild cases, hopefully as many people as possible safe uh, and make a speedy recovery as well. And yet, of course, that's going to put a real choker on the economy going into year end. It's going to limit the travel, which we're starting to see in the in the in the numbers for the subways and stuff like that and the traffic congestion and you know it's gonna rain in output from the factories and stuff like that but next year the great hope is we get this done we get through that we get people coming back to work in earnest we get rid of those restrictions and we feel that policy boost starting to come through from uh, the officials as well it's a turning point you know the market is very bullish on this thought already because you don't want to wait until we get there before you start pricing it in we've got you know Citigroup for example biggest trade of the year long Hang Seng short US uh, equities next year looking for that China to pick up just as the rest of the world comes down again a little bit so uh, or, or maybe turns negative or maybe China saves the day for the world but that's the kind of narrative mm. that you have to play off again I think you know year end low liquidity Maybe we sort of sit on our hands a little bit now until we get there, but uh, with a little bit of up and down volatility. But that's really, you know, kind of what people want to get their teeth stuck into when we get into January. Paul Dobson, our executive editor for Markets here in the Asia Pacific, joining us out of Singapore. In fact, let's just build on what Paul was just saying and look ahead to next year. So this time last year, uh, strategists were basically calling for a rally. And just to call you out, most of you were wrong. <laughs> You didn't know anyway what was going to happen, right? But in any case, of course, that's again the case right now, looking at next year. And might they be right this time around? Let's bring in our Asia Stocks reporter, Ishika Mukherjee, to talk us through, of course, this rally again 
that strategists are predicting <laughs> for next year. What returns are we looking at here? Ishika. <laughs> Hey, hey, David, they may just be right this time around. Um, there are a lot of things that were weighing on the market this year, be it China's COVID policy, the chip down cycle, a strong dollar, and all of those reasons are set to sort of abate into next year. So strategists this time see the market rallying 9%. Um, there's a wide dispersion in forecasts, but yes, the average is a 9%, and that would be an outperformance to the S&P 500 finally after two years of uh, lagging that index. Um, forward, you can see the, the optimism in forward earnings estimates, actually. Um, they're up more than 3% for the uh, Asia gauge, the MSCI Asia Pacific excluding Japan index. Um, and downgrades continue for the S&P 500. Having said that, the first half of the year is going to be worse than the second, most probably, according to an, uh, strategists, that is. Um, because you have China's bumpy reopening, you still have the Fed decisions yeah. to play out in the markets. So we talked about a lot of key changes in sentiment in China. What, what are some other, other shifts we're seeing in, in terms of recommendations for next year? Yeah, so aside from China being investable again, hopefully, um, South Korea and uh, to a lesser extent Taiwan are back online as bets for next year um, with strategists seeing the semiconductor uh, inventory uh, issues sort of abating into the second half of the year. Um, the other change we're seeing is that India and Indonesia, which were the top performing markets in Asia until recently, um, some profit taking happening there um, on richer valuations and uh, the idea that there are way cheaper markets in Asia to look towards now. So let's let, look at some of the key risks that uh, they've laid out or uh, as the cynic in me describes as how could they be wrong for next year? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you have a global recession potentially coming up, right, and a slowdown in this region. So if you talk about that 9% rally forecast, that's actually not even taking the MSCI Asia Pacific Index up to its early 2021 peak. It's down more than 20% from there. So you can see that kind of pessimism sort of baked into the forecast, despite really attractive valuations in some markets and some pockets. Um, right now. Um, the other risk is China's bumpy reopening and also the Fed not acting enough to curb inflation at a time growth is slowing. So the, the risks are very real. So the strategists may just be wrong yet again. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a low base, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. I don't know. But then again, you know. Absolutely. <laughs> what else would yeah. they say? What else can they say? Yeah. And you know, who's to say that everything changes by January 1st, right? It's just yeah. a date, really, at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, anything can happen. Ishika, thank you so much. Ishika Mukherjee, Asia Talks reporter. Um, now, yeah, she's crunching numbers, piling all these analyst reports together. Well, we'll come back to her throughout the year <laughs> to see, see <laughs> how things are going. All right, let's go to the first word news. We have Bonnie Quinn in New York. Hey, Bonnie. Hey, Yvonne. Thank you. <laughs> Well, media reports say that the number of COVID positive dead in Beijing's funeral homes is surging. That is raising concerns that China is hiding data amid its worst wave yet. Staff at a crematorium in Beijing told the Financial Times they cremated at least 30 COVID victims, while Reuters says funeral homes in the capital are overwhelmed. However, China has not reported a single COVID fatality in two weeks. China's top leaders plan to focus on boosting the economy next year, hinting at business-friendly policies. At the Central Economic Work Conference, Xi and other senior officials pledged to revive consumption and support the private sector, a marked shift from recent years. Economists say the cues from China show the priority for next year is on boosting GDP, with policymakers likely to target growth of 5% or higher. Sam Bankman-Fried is said to be planning to drop his fight against extradition to the U.S. Sources tell Bloomberg that the disgraced FTX co-founder is expected to disclose that he won't fight extradition in court appearance next week. He's locked up in a correctional facility in the Bahamas after he was denied bail. U.S. prosecutors have accused him of a range of crimes, including wire fraud. Peru's President Dina Boluarte has ruled out resigning, saying that it would not solve the country's political crisis. She's still insisting on bringing forward presidential elections a day after Congress voted against the proposal. Boluarte has asked Congress to approve the constitutional reform needed to hold the early vote. She says that's what 83% of Peru's population wants.
Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Vonnie Quinn. This is Bloomberg. David. Just ahead, uh, we're talking private equity with Franklin Templeton, and uh, really that they're out for next year. They see a rebound. Uh, we'll talk down rounds. Have we seen that? We'll talk D ratings. Have we seen that? We're talking food prices today, really the key investment themes as the world grapples for enough food and what their outlook is really for, for, for food prices going into going into next year. That's coming up. You're watching Bloomberg. Good morning.